All right, so um, today we have, I'm pleased to present Rob Corliss. Um, Rob Corliss did his uh, bachelor's in mathematics and computer science at the University of British Columbia. He has a master's in math at Waterloo in 1982 and his PhD, PhD at UBC. And he was advised by G.V. Parkinson. He is Emeritus Distinguished University Professor at Western University in Canada, in London, London, Ontario. Um, and he's a member of the Rotman Institute of Philosophy and of the Ontario Research Center for uh, Computer Algebra. He is an adjunct professor at the Sheridan School of Computer Science. He is editor in chief of uh, Maple Transactions and he's been a Maple user for a long time. Um, his primary research interests are computer linear and polynomial algebra, which is what attracted me to Rob, um, and uh, computational dynamical systems and computational special functions. The underlying principles he is most concerned with are computational discovery and computational epistemology um, and ethics of AI, especially in teaching. So um, he's going to be giving a talk on a recent paper of his, uh, a fractal eigenvector. So I'll turn it over to, to Rob now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. And thank you for the invitation to be there in person. And I'm really sorry that, it, that the weather just forbid it last week with the freezing rain. And this week, maybe we could have done it with the snow, but uh, other things have come up here. So that I do regret not being there in person, and I hope I have the chance to visit another time. Um, three things. The first is that I have 50 slides here, which is way too many. Um, I'm not going to get through all 50 slides, and I'm not even going to try. We're just going to do whatever uh, we can with what we've got. Um, but there is one slide that I that I kind of want to get to, and it's the very last slide, which is the acknowledgments. So I'll try to get to that one. But in particular, I want to acknowledge uh, Professor Laura Reed at the uh, uh, Computer Science Department at Western. She invited me a number of years ago to give a talk uh, in the tech, teaching and research in computer science session. And Benoit Mandelbrot had just died then. And I decided that I would give a little talk on Mandelbrot polynomials. And that started the entire thread of research that led to this talk. So I owe Laura a debt of gratitude for, for this. Um, before I begin, I'm going to... Uh, uh announce a new journal it's not all that new it's now two years old this journal is maple transactions it's an open access journal with no page charges uh, and this is made possible by a partnership between maplesoft and the um, what's called a, a scholarship western which is really westerns uh, participation in a consortium of ontario libraries uh, university libraries, and they have a commitment to make open scholarly journals. And they we use the software uh, from the Public Knowledge Project, which was written at Simon Fraser University. And quite a few journals are using this now, open journal systems, it's called, and it works quite well. Uh, the purpose of Maple Transactions is to have expository articles on inter uh, topics of interest to the Maple community. So we have a number of uh, very serious uh, and interesting heavyweight people who have written for Maple Transactions already. We've got a lovely paper by Richard Brent, which you might find interesting, called it Some Instructive Mathematical Errors. We have papers by Nick, Tr Nick Trefathen and we hope to encourage lots of participation. So if you have some interesting papers, please send them our way. Um, just to get started on what we're going to be doing here, I'll give you a list of some of the papers and other things that uh, underlie what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to be talking about Mandelbrot polynomials and matrices. And my former PhD student, Piers Lawrence, who's attending the talk, I, I believe, uh, today, he had the fundamental idea which opened the door to all these results. I gave this little talk uh, at the TRIX uh, seminar at the behest of Laura Reed, and I had a method for uh, constructing matrices whose eigenvalues were 
the roots of these Mandelbrot polynomials, which are more fundamental, and we'll see how those go. But Pierce's idea was better, and we'll see exactly how that goes in here. Um, we wrote a paper 10 years ago now, which appeared in the uh, John Fest proceedings. It's a celebration of John Bar Borwin's birthday. And we talked about the largest root of the Mandelbrot polynomials. We'll see what that result was a little bit later. But I got interested in this earlier by uh, looking at the Mandelbrot polynomials from uh, Dario Bini and his co-workers work on uh, MP salt, which is the fastest polynomial solver that I know of. And they use Mandelbrot polynomials as a test case. And I got interested in there. So I can, I can do better than just solving them directly. And we, let's get eigenvalue problems going on there. But I must acknowledge the, their work. And in fact, they still have the fastest techniques for solving these things. And Dario tells me he's got um, a solution up to uh, degree almost a billion on this, which is more than we can do with the techniques that we have under underway at the moment. Um, Neil Kalkin and Eunice Chan and I wrote a paper uh, that appeared in Maple Transactions, some facts and conjectures about Mandelbrot polynomials. Oh, I should say all of my slides here are available on my GitHub. So if you go to my GitHub uh, site and go to a, a, a fractal eigenvector repository, you'll find the, the slides there. And the slides have links. So I could actually click on this and go to the, the uh, Maple Transactions paper on that. So you may wish to download the slides. Uh, and then, of course, the, there's the paper in the American Mathematical Monthly, um, the op point, which is the direct uh, foundation for this for this talk. I should say a little bit about the monthly. Everybody knows everybody knows the American Mathematical Monthly. It's uh, uh, but not many people understand that it is in fact the highest impact mathematics journal there is. Uh, it is always in the top 50 in JSTOR, and it's competing with chemistry and biology and physics journals, and it, it, it's always in the top 50, and sometimes it's in the top 20. There are people who, Nobel Prize winners, who've written papers for the monthly. There are uh, fields medalists who have written papers for the monthly. So everybody knows the monthly, but maybe they don't know really <laughs> what they've got with that. So uh, they get a thousand submissions a year. And so I, you can tell that I'm really proud that we have a paper in the monthly on this. So another thing, another uh, uh, work that's related to this is Eunice Chan's master's thesis. So Eunice is uh, now a professor at Chinese University of Hong Kong in Shenzhen and in, in the Faculty of Medicine, uh, doing data science for evidence-based medicine, which is a little bit of a jump from uh, homotopy methods and eigenvalue methods for Mandelbrot like polynomials, but her thesis, her master's thesis, uh, has over 500 downloads now, which is uh, actually nobody knows what those statistics mean, but you go and check on other things. That's actually quite high. A lot of people seem to be quite interested in, in her thesis, and I'm very happy about that. Uh, there's more. We have uh, uh, papers on extending this idea into matrix polynomials and to generalizing uh, companion matrix ideas. And this turns out to be quite interesting. Uh, so this isn't just uh, an expository work. There are, there's actual math research that, that comes out of this. And, and I don't want to be a math snob. I don't want to say that, okay, there's some kinds that are important and some, some kinds that are not, because I used to be an applied mathematician, and now I'm just kind of uh, having some fun. Uh, but I don't want to distinguish between those these kinds of things. All I want to say here is that these ideas look like they might be simple on the surface, but in fact, we get fairly deep rather quickly, and I get lost rather quickly. So we'll see what we can say. Um, this is strongly related to my new thread of research, which is what I'm calling Bohemian matrices. So you might be able to see my tie in this tiny little picture here. It's got a Bohemian images on the tie. So uh, we'll see what those, those are, if you like. Uh, here's some papers on Bohemian matrices. This comes from bounded height matrices of integers. There's some uh, BO for bounded, HE for height, and matrix of integers, and we decided to call them 
uh, Bohemian Matrices. So if you go to bohemianmatrices.com, you'll get a, a, a list of a bunch of images and some related papers. Uh, finally, uh, Neil and Eunice and I have just completed uh, an online, an open educational resource called Computational Discovery in Jupiter. Then we have one chapter in there on metal rut uh, matrices and polynomials and another chapter on uh, Bohemian matrices. And this is going to be a Siam book. It's in the hands of the compositors right now. And they're working directly from the HTML, which is kind of courageous of them. Uh, we used something called Jupyter Book to put that online. Please have a look at that if you like. So there's the collection of material with the, which, which I'm starting with. And I want to say that uh, if anybody has any questions as we go along, we might as well ask them now because I'm not going to get through all of this material. It's just going to be, there's just going to be too much to do. And well, we'll just stop when we have to stop and we'll continue the conversation as we can. So here's what the talk is about. Here's the picture I want, I want to explain. And you look at this and you go, what on earth is that? We have, you know, it looks like, I don't know, black flames, black stripy flames on a, on a white background. And there's obviously some kind of sharp, jagged structure in there, but what is it that we're looking at? And here I'm calling it an eigenvector, but it it looks like a, a two-dimensional, well, well, somewhere between one and two dimensions object. Anyway, I don't, I haven't tried to compute the fractal dimension of this thing. Uh, it's probably pretty close to two, actually. But in what sense is this an eigenvector? I've never seen, you know, eigenvectors that look like this before. So I tweeted this. A few years ago, I tweeted this picture uh, or a picture like it that was computed with MATLAB. And uh, people are, oh, okay, what, what's all this about? So let's see if I can explain what this is all about. Begin the story with concrete instances. So let's start with a one by one matrix, M1, we'll call it. It's just a matrix with a one in it. Okay, that's kind of boring. M2. I'm going to put two copies of M1 in the upper uh, left corner and the lower right corner. And then I'm going to glue them together with ones. So I've got the matrix is 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. Pretty simple, easy three by three matrix. The important fact is that it was built out of two copies of the previous one. And we'll see this, recur this recursion uh, being used again and again. So the transpose of the right eigenvector, so uh, corresponding to the dominant eigenvalue, is approximately 1.5698.7549. We could plot the components of this eigenvector against the index into the vector. I'd never done that in a math class. I'd never plotted an eigenvector in a math class. But the engineers, they like to do that because the eigenvectors give you the shapes of oscillations of things. When, you, when the eigenvalues are natural frequencies of oscillation, the eigenvectors are the modes of oscillation. So they do that to see what the oscillations look like. And so, well, there's this is a boring plot. Uh, we have 1.569 and 0.75, but I plot it on a log scale, log, log two of the component. All right. <laughs> Here's a graph. A, di a directed graph, actually, one vertex with one, and interpreting the one by one matrix as an adjacency matrix, it says that the vertex one has an arc connecting it to itself. So we have this simple little. I'm I'm told that there are graph theory uh, experts in the audience, and I hope that's so because we have some open questions, and I really hope that you can help me to answer some of these things. All right, that's a boring directed graph, but here's the graph for M two. We have two copies of M1, each with a loop for a loop, for, or, pardon me, an arc from one to one and an arc from three to three, and a connection from vertex one to vertex three, a connection from vertex uh, three to vertex two, and a connection from vertex two to, to uh, vertex one. So we're building things backwards. We're building the graphs from the matrices, which is a bit weird. Normally we go the other way around. So let's go one step up. 
this matrix is seven by seven. Again, we have two copies of the previous one. You have a copy of M2 in the upper left and a copy of M2 in the lower right. Then we connect with three ones. So the three new arcs that come in here. And E3 is the uh, elementary vector 0, 0, 1. And E1 is the elementary vector 1, 0, 0. And so you just have these little ones in the corner. And explicitly, there it is. You see the copy of M2 up in the upper left and the copy of M2 in the, in the lower right. And the little bits of red glue sticking it all together. Now you see one important fact here is that this matrix is Upper Hessenberg. It has that what Upper Hessenberg means is that it is uh, upper triangular except for one subdiagonal. And that first main subdiagonal is in fact all ones. So it's unit Upper Hessenberg. So here's the next graph. Uh, two copies of M2, and you glue everything together in exactly the same way. You introduce one new vertex and three new arcs and glue them together. Great, we've got matrices, graphs, we must have polynomials. So I'm going to define the polynomials P, K plus one of C to be the determinant of C times the identity matrix plus M sub K. Notice the plus sign and the off by one index. The reason I do that is some papers did it with the, the plus one index and other papers did it with negative uh, of the matrices and it's, well, okay, we just have to live with the off by one stuff. Okay, but if we do that, then P, uh, P2 is C plus one, because that's the one by one matrix. And P3 is this determinant, which happens to be C times P2 squared plus one. And P4 happens to be C times P3 squared plus one. All right, so there's a theorem that if we define PK plus one as this particular determinant, then that recurrence relation holds. And then we can take P0 of C to be zero and P1 of C to be one if we want. I had a proof based on a uh, sure complement of this. Uh, Peer's proof, the original proof was probably uh, LU factoring. We were just trying to discuss uh, that the other day or yesterday, uh, how the LU factoring came in. Uh, and we had a, a Laplace expansion in the middle proof, but the one that, that we first wrote out was a sure complement. And, at, in 2016, when I was writing this up, uh, I was at the SIAM annual meeting where Don Knuth was the uh, von Neumann lecturer. And he came and he sat down next to me while I was working on the paper. And he said, what, what you working on? I said, well, <laughs> and I handed him the, the, the paper. And then he said, oh, can you do Euclid polynomials? And I said, I don't know what's Euclid polynomial. So then he told me what Euclid polynomials were and it turned out later that we could, so that we had got a paper on that. Later that night at the uh, mini symposia at the reception, Don saw me coming into the thing and he waved from, from the other side and he waved a napkin. He said, don't go away, Come, I've got something for you. And so I went over and I, uh, she said, I don't like your proof. <laughs> He didn't like the sure complement proof. Here's a better proof. And he handed me a napkin with this proof in it on in, in, in a few lines. So this, I, I definitely like this proof better. So you do have to use the fact that it's unit upper Hestenberg. And you notice that the entry in the top right corner is one. And here's what Don used to said. The determinant is linear in the first row. So you can break that first row into everything except the one and a, a line of zeros and that one. And so you've got now two determinants to work on. And so the determinant we want is the sum of these two determinants. And the first one is the determinant of a block uh, upper triangular matrix or block lower triangular. And the other one is uh, uh, one times a, a unit upper, just, just one. So it just falls out. So yeah, okay. Now. 
A quick question. I've used this unit upper Hessenberg phrase. How many of you have um, heard of that term before? I, I know this is known in numerical analysis. One, two, at least. In the and thank you very much for raising your hands. And anybody who's never heard of it but doesn't want to admit it, please send me an email because I do want to know. Whether I won't tell anybody, but uh, there we go. But I'm glad to know that that this is known to some people at least. So, with fewer words, exactly the same proof. We break this thing up into a matrix. Uh, which doesn't have the one in the upper right hand corner and a matrix which does have the one but a zero first row and you can just verify for yourselves that the determinant is satisfies the recurrence relation so we now have our first theorem here's the eigenvalues of m11 which are the roots of p12 of minus set and now you see why these are called mandelbrot polynomials it's because what we get, the zeros of these things are, will give you periodic orbits under the Mandelbrot iteration, which therefore are part of the Mandelbrot set. They're a very special part of the Mandelbrot set, but at least they're part of it. And by plotting the zeros of these polynomials, you get uh, something like the outline of a uh, Mandelbrot set. So this is a thousand by thousand matrix or 1023 by 1023, and you can compute the eigenvalues in a couple of seconds on a uh, modest little computer. And great, if you wanted to do the, the polynomials and find the roots of the polynomials, that's harder for the following reason. So look at the size of these coefficients. This is P3, P4, P5, P6, P7, P8, and P9, and that's a log scale. So P9 has coefficients that are size 10 to the 44. Uh, and if you know the theory of conditioning of polynomials, the size of these coefficients uh, directly impacts the condition number of evaluation and therefore of root finding. And so if you want to find the roots of these polynomials, you have to use multiple precision. Once you've expanded the polynomial and written down these polynomial with integer coefficients, they're all positive integer coefficients, and that's easy to prove. Um, and the, finding the roots directly is a very hard problem, which is why MPSolve uses it as a test problem. So the other thing that's obvious from this picture is the coefficients rise as, as the index goes from zero up to the degree, and they peak at a top and they go down. So the word for that is unimodal. And well, it's obvious that they're unimodal, so we should be able to prove it. I tried really hard. I tried really hard to prove that these are actually log concave after the first little section. I couldn't do it. I gave it to a really good student and he spent quite a bit of time over one summer trying to do, trying to prove it. He couldn't do it either. I've talked to some experts on unimodality, and they say, "Well, actually, um, oh, squirrel." And <laughs> so, if anybody can manage to prove that the polynomial coefficients of the Mandelbrot polynomials are unimodal, I would love to publish that in Maple Transactions. So, you know. There's the first open uh, conjecture with regard to, well, they're so simple. You square them, shift them, add one. You must be able to prove that they're unimodal. I can't do it. Um, and of course, these are connected to the Mandelbrot iteration. Um, Zn plus one equals Zn squared plus C. Well, if C is not zero, divide by C and write Pn is Zn divided by C. And then we get this iteration. These things are called the Mandelbrot polynomials. Different papers uses diff use different indexing and it's a total pain. Right. I just have to get used to it. Okay. The dominant eigenvalue. If you remember that sharp uh, Mandelbrot picture poking out to the right, we have a long spike and a largest eigenvalue in magnitude is actually real and pretty close to two. And the 
the question is, you know, how close to two is it? Uh, Piers and I managed to prove with help with, from Neil Kalkin, uh, we proved that if you evaluate PN plus one at a particular point near to minus two, namely minus two plus uh, three theta squared times four to the minus N over two, you get cosine theta out of it plus order four to the minus N. And so that gives you the dominant eigenvalue, actually the dominant few positive eigenvalues by plugging in theta equals pi over two, theta equals three pi over two and so on in there. And so you, we get the dominant eigenvalue rather accurately doing this thing. And you can get it much more accurately because this estimate is good enough to start Newton's method on. So you can, that dominant eigenvalue is now, you can now regard that as known, it's an, it's an answer. All right, so we've got the eigenvalue. Uh, this has to be simple, real, and positive by the Perron Frobenius theory. And half of you will be going, oh yeah, of course that's true. Maybe all of you will be going that. I didn't know the Perron Frobenius theory before Neil taught it to me. So I'm very happy, happily to, happy to learn about that. More, we know that the corresponding eigenvector must have all positive components. Aha. So let's look at some more. So we looked already at the vector for M2, that funny little thing on the on the left there. Now, if we do the vector for M3, so we have uh, up high uh, on the left, da, 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 okay. We can uh, compare M3 and M4, and we see, you know, Da 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 da. Okay, there's some kind of repetitive thing going on in there. M four and M five. I'm not going to sing anymore. M five and M six, and then jumping to M eleven and M twelve. And there's the first picture. Ah, uh, that doesn't look like that at all. <laughs> okay, well, <clears throat> what we're doing now is we're analyzing an easier eigenvector than this of the first picture. The more difficult eigenvector is actually the eigenvector of M20 times the anti-identity. So it just rotates everything uh, around, actually if you multiply on the right, it's rotating all the columns around. It makes a symmetric matrix whose eigenvalues happen to be in absolute value, the singular values of MN. So this is this, this vector is actually a singular vector of MN, but it's an eigenvector of uh, MJ. Okay, okay, okay. So we just did the easy one. I am... Not sure what the time is here. Let me just check my timing device. Oh, good. So we seem to have seem to have lots of lots of times. So what we've been looking at is the simpler eigenvector, and I already mentioned implicitly that it, each successive eigenvector seems to contain two copies of the previous eigenvector. And since each matrix contains two copies of the previous matrix, maybe this is kind of natural. That's what we see. But humans are really good at seeing things that aren't there. That's called pareidolia. Uh, so we should, we should prove something. But let's just go back and have a look at the, the pictures again. So if you look at the picture on the left for M5, and the picture on the right, what I eventually saw in there after looking at it quite a bit, there's there's a number of ways where you can see things are similar. There's going forward and backward and all sorts of things. What I eventually saw was that, that that whole vector on the left appears twice in the in on the one on the right. So that the whole vector gets squashed a little bit and moved up and appears on the left and it basically is copied uh, to, to appear on the right. It certainly looks that way. And once you see it, you go, oh yeah, okay. So let's see if we can try and prove that. Have you ever 
How about writing writing your initial operation right, with the Chronica product? Um, I haven't done any Chronica products. Uh, well, you can think of it as a Chronica product, except for the glue, right? right. You're, the, the Chronica product would put just the two copies, uh, the Chronica product with the, uh, the identity matrix would put the two copies there, but I've got extra little bits of glue in. Right. So there's the two red ones below here and another red one up in the in the corner. I don't know how whether I'm being swapped around and my hands are showing the right way uh, in there. It's not quite a Chronicle product, I don't think. Here, let's let's have a look at the the more formal formulation here. We've got the two copies, uh, MN in the upper left. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Uh, an MN in the lower right. And then we've got essentially just a one very close to the to the zero in the center and a one very close to the zero in the center and a one way up in the top corner and the in the right here. And what we were seeing was a copy of the old eigenvector, uh, maybe something new and, a, and another copy of the old eigenvector. So if we split the eigenvector of MN plus one, into these three pieces, maybe we can figure out what's going on. We're also going to need not the PNs, but actually the characteristic polynomial of MN. So the determinant of ZI minus MN. That just fixes all the sign in, signs up and it fixes the uh, off by one index. So the indices, indices now match. CN of the dominant eigenvalue rho N is zero. So if we do that and just plug everything in, we get this theorem. The theorem says the solution to that equation can be constructed recursively as follows. So X1 is just going to be one because the first eigenvector of the one by one matrix is just one. Great, I can do that. I can do that in my head. Um, subsequent vectors of dimension two to the N plus one minus one, I hope I've got the N plus one correct in there, are defined by the following polynomial recurrence relation. So the bottom one is this vector function xn, but evaluated not at row n, at row n plus one. So the bottom one is row n plus one. And the middle entry, the scalar component, the, what we call u there, is the characteristic polynomial, the nth characteristic polynomial, evaluated at row n plus one. So that's not going to be zero. We will simplify that. And then the upper part is going to be the scalar rho n plus one times cn of rho n plus one times the whole vector that lives in the bottom of this thing. Now, rho n plus one is, is we've got an asymptotic formula for it. It's uh, two minus order four to the n minus one four to the minus n minus one, I mean. And it's quite close to rho n, but it's not the same. So the xn of rho n plus one is not going to be the same as xn of rho n, but it's going to look really similar because it's polynomial in the rho, and the rho n plus one is going to be quite, quite close to rho n. So what we were seeing was not identity, but closeness. So that, that's kind of interesting. Uh, and I think this theorem explains what we saw in that eigenvector. The proof is about a paragraph long in the paper, and I don't think it's surprising enough to talk about here. You just plug the stuff in and chug it through, and it all works out. Uh, there's something to talk about about you know you, you get two different ways to evaluate the characteristic polynomial maybe that's interesting uh but i'm not going to have time to to deal with that now <laughs> oh, 50 slides uh so i'm not a graph theorist so when i think of eigenvectors so because of my uh, uh, long ago engineering and vibrations training, I think of mode shapes. But people, a lot of people think about eigenvectors, in particular the Perron vector. They think of that as 
the components give you measures of centrality or influence. Hey, Rob. I hope. Um, yeah. You hold up for one second. We have a question. Yes. Sure. Can, can you hear him? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. So can you remind us what is rho again? I wish sure. I got lost. Sure. Rho is the dominant eigenvalue. So we have an asymptotic uh, uh, estimate for it. I've got this funny little bar here. I gotta move it out of the way so I can't see it. So we have the dominant eigenvalue of mn can be expressed as rho n is two minus a little bit. And we can even see it on a picture. So the dominant eigenvalue is right out near two. Sure, yes. And then in your theorem about this component of X, so what do you mean by X n plus one at the dominant eigenvalue at n plus one? So, uh... So these are eigenvectors. Sometimes I say eigenvalue when I mean eigenvector. I hope this is not the case uh, in this case. Uh, so that so we have a one vector. So x one is a one a dimension one eigenvector, and subsequent vectors are dimension uh, two to the n two to the n plus one minus one. So x n would be dimension two to the n minus one. And xn plus one would be dimension two to the n plus one minus one. So these are vectors. So this is a, a vector which is constructed out of previous vectors. So this is a vector recurrence relation. Okay, now I got it. Okay, okay. Can, can I have a quick question? Can you show the, the picture of your like fancy vector? I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear that. Can you show the picture of your, your uh, fractal vector again? Your, your fractal? Oh. Can you show that again? <laughs> There's These guys. The final one. The, the other uh, go forward one slide. Point so yeah, this one is this one is the the vector which we're not analyzing yet. This is this is a vector of of a dimension a million, and it is actually the largest, or pardon me, the dominant, the eigenvector corresponding to the dominant singular value. If I took this vector and I did a sort, what would I see? I couldn't hear that. I sorted this vector from lowest to highest values. What would it be? Would it be like lots of flat steps? Would it be like a double staircase? What would I get? I like that thought. I suspect a double staircase. I just don't know. It, it definitely, you're, I never thought of it uh, in terms of a double staircase until now, but you're absolutely right. It, this is, it's the same kind of, of jaggedness, but here we've got going up and going down. So you're right, we need to sort it somehow. <laughs> well, and, and it's on a log scale. So I wouldn't you wouldn't see this pattern if you just plotted the components. You actually have to plot the log of the components. And this is log base two is where it, where it shows up mostly. Um, so this is not a devil's staircase. This is a, I don't know, a devil, devil's fire escape ladder or something. Well, right now it's not, but if you sort it, it might be a devil's staircase. If you sort it, it might be. Uh, Sorting is a natural operation because back in the original graph, those are just, you know, relabeling the vertices, which is a graph isomorphism. Yeah. yeah. It would too. Okay, thank you. I, I never thought of that. I, as you say, I'm not a graph theorist. So is this something that people, the graph theorists frequently do? I'm not a graph theorist either. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but he knows graphs, some graph theory. So it's a... Okay, okay. <laughs> but, but I see multiple copies. It looks like if I drew a horizontal line through here, I would hit the same value several times. So maybe not. Maybe I only almost hit the same value. So now I want to do this. It's super fast, just do it. <laughs> just sort of. uh, I wonder if I, okay, I, I will do this directly after the talk. We'll see what <laughs> I, I had a question, Rob. Sure. Um, 
is there something that's causing because the these graphs are not they're directed so they're they're not uh, the so you have um, an asymmetric matrix there. Is there a reason that the, the eigenvalues come out to be all real? Or are they not all real and you're doing some, because I like- in a No, the, 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 there is a, because the entries are of the matrix are just zeros and one. So the, the entries are non-negative. So the Perron Frobenius theory applies to that matrix, even though it's not a, uh, even though it's a directed, graph and not a graph thing. Just the, the Perron Frobenius theory says if you've got a, a matrix with non-negative entries uh, and it is irreducible in a technical sense, doesn't reduce to uh, uh, two block uh, matrices, then it'll have a single dominant positive eigenvalue and the eigenvector corresponding to that eigenvalue will have positive components. So it's it's a lovely theory that's based on graph theory, but actually applies to matrices that just have positive entry or non-negative entries in them. Yeah, I was surprised too. So there's the digraph for M13. So it's not really surprising that a, a an eigenvector of the adjacency matrix or the directed graph for uh, showing counting the arcs for all those things would have a a fractal measure measure of centrality. Some of those vertices are going to be much less influential than others. So that's 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 kind of understandable. I like that. And by the way, these drawing. Um, the graphs of the matrices is this is done in uh, MATLAB or Maple by using the four spring method. And I first came across this with Tim Davis's sparse, uh, sweet sparse matrix collection. So they draw pictures of matrices that are based on which entries are, are non zero and which are zero, and it gives you some really nice um, images of of the graphs that come out or out of, of the matrices that come out naturally from there. So, and this all gets done automatically. Uh, this particular graph was drawn, I believe with MATLAB, but you can draw them in Maple as well. That's super pretty. I'm afraid we're gonna to have to give up the room in about three minutes. All right, that's, that's I said I wouldn't make it. Um, there's some, and we got some questions in, so I'm glad about that. The slides are available, so I will just skip straight to uh, the end. I'm glad we got some questions, and I just thank Laura Reed and thank you all for listening to me. I, I greatly appreciate that. Thanks, Rob. I enjoyed it. Thank you, Thomas, for coming. Time for one question. Question. I'm sorry, I could not hear that. Oh. Just usually for eigenvalue in the easy system, uh, system we uh, usually uh, study the stability. So I want to know for this is the uh, fractal, fractal uh, eigenvalue, eigenvector, it can be used the same thing or what kind of application? I'm really sorry, but if could you type the question into chat or send it to me by email? I'd be very uh, happy to. She's asking about uh, what kind of applications can you think of for this work? Okay, um, first one is software testing. So this is the, the very first application would be, I wanna test my algorithms for finding eigenvalues. And we have actually uncovered problems in MATLAB's eig places where it failed to converge with uh, uh, bohemian matrices like these. The second application is more speculative, um, which is, I think we might be able to find faster ways for finding eigenvalues for general matrices out of this. So again, it's a computational thing, but you know, testing existing algorithms, but maybe developing new algorithms. And I'm quite serious about that because the, the Mandelbrot uh, matrices, you'd think that they would be order n cubed to find the eigenvalues for, and they're actually not. They're they're better than that. 
and it's surprising that they should be better, but some interesting things are happening in there. Um, the third application that comes up of matrices like these, uh, well, actually there's, there's a, a lot of them. There's a lot of interest in matrices for signal processing that have entries which are plus one and minus one. There's, there, there's a number. The most surprising application is swag. So you, I have here a, a tie that I designed and we, we uh, I printed, uh, Eunice and I uh, printed a bunch of these things with the patterns that we make. So I made calendars uh, with the images that come out of these things. Maybe that's not a very serious uh, applied mathematics thing, but uh, it's real. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much this speaker. And I'll be looking for uh, a sort in my email box in about 20 minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. And uh, one away. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you very much again for the invitation. And one day I hope to come in person. Yes, please. Bye for now. Bye-bye. I'm looking off now.